you are one of thousands of people enjoying the content produced by Christ Community Church's C3 Media. First, we want to say thank you and let you know it's our pleasure to serve you. As a nonprofit organization, we are always looking for strategic and financial partners. If you are benefiting from our content, we ask that you consider partnering with us. Even a small donation like $1 per week will go a long way. Thank you for your continued support, and we know God has a great plan for your life. I feel like there's a theme that God's put on my heart about the laws of the kingdom, that uh, there are certain things that govern our world. We call them laws, and I'll talk about those in a few minutes. And I'm going to describe for you that there's, since there's like natural laws, there's also the spiritual laws. And uh, I want to talk about one of the greatest keys the Bible tells us, and I'll go back to it in Romans 8.1. It says, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because the spirit, uh, says, of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. And so I want to talk this morning about freedom from the law of sin and death. And uh, I think too often we as a, as a culture, maybe as a church, we, uh, we simply ignore the things that create uh, for us, the law of sin and death. This sounds very simple to a lot of people, but just to go over it again, the person who sins, that soul shall die. So every person has a death sentence on their life because all have sinned. And because of sin, it brings death to that person's soul and eventually to their physical body. So the law of sin and death, we're told that there's a greater law that trumps that, the law of life. And we're going to talk about that. So that's kind of the three parts here. So we're going to introduce it. We're going to talk about what it is. And we're talking about how to overcome it. And then we're going to pray for people at the end. And the Lord's going to do some amazing things in your life. You're just going to be, you're going to be so glad that you heard this thing. Because it's such a joy to announce to you the good things that Jesus has. So it's freedom from the law of sin and death. However, that's why that all men have died, and uh, we know that it's because of sin, all have sinned. However, there's a greater law that's in operation, which is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And that's what we want to talk about this morning. Amen. So having said that, so let's go jump right into some of the things going on in our culture. We have uh, all types of things that bring death in people's lives. You have, for instance, I uh, just read this headline about this beautiful young lady 30 years old, she was Miss USA in 2019. She was an attorney in college, she was a track star. She was uh, just known for her eloquence and her beauty. Uh, And she just committed suicide uh, just uh, three or four days ago. 30 years old, and the pain in her life was so great that she jumped off an eighth floor uh, apartment building in uh, New York City. And then we just had, just uh, maybe knew this a couple of weeks ago, a local church here in town, a volunteer youth worker uh, ended his life, committed suicide. And you can see that then the stats bear out, especially with COVID and so on, but the, I think I read somewhere that we're about 8,000% suicide rate. Uh, it's jumped up that much. We have the amount of uh, increase in alcohol uh, uh, consumption. The people who are uh, talk about the, uh, the fentanyl uh, crisis that's going on, the drug crisis that's in our country. And I'm here to describe to you not just our culture, but it's in the church. Amen. And that's the part that saddens me the most. It's not that people struggle with sin. We all struggle with sin. But there's a higher law that you can tap into to set you free from the law of sin and death. And that's what God's after. God is after for us to walk in the spirit, to be able to overcome those things that so easily trip us up. And I think there comes to be a, and when you come to church is a lot of times is that we have messages that are very motivational and inspirational. But there are times like this morning, I think we just need to look at the cold hard facts And we need to go through things. And so I just want to talk to you about some just universal laws that apply to everybody. Um, If you go through the scriptures, there's an interesting verse in Job 38, 33, where it talks about God is speaking to Job. And Job, his whole life had fallen apart. He had been a very successful man, one of the wealthiest men ever to live. In fact, Job was one of the oldest books in the Bible. And Job was complaining about the things that have befallen him. 
and his friends that are sent to kind of comfort him and mourn with him in this crisis. He's lost his family, lost his health, lost his possessions. He's lost everything. Does that sound familiar? There's a lot of people like that. And that Job is talking about how that he said, if I could just talk to God, I would give him, a, if I put it in my words, I'll give him a piece of my mind. I'll let God know you're unfair, unjust, I'm righteous, I'm living for you, and all I get is misery. And this is, and then Job records what God said to him. And this is in Job 38, 33. God speaks to him. He says, Job, do you know the laws of the universe? And he talks about some of the things, like I set the boundaries of the ocean. I set the boundaries of space. I know the stars by name. And he goes through all these things that he have, he's done. He talks about different animals that he created. And Job, do you have any responsibility for any of these things? Stand up like a man and answer me. And Job says, God, you are so much greater. I wish I had never opened my mouth. I should never have complained. But the question is, is that God asked Job, he says, do you know the laws of the universe? And I'm here just to encourage you this morning, is that I'm going to try to use some natural laws to bridge you over into the spiritual laws. Because there's a lot of things that people get and they kind of understand. But so doing and preparing for this, these thoughts as I just began to go through just different laws that govern our natural world. Now, I will say this is that we used to use a booklet by a group called Campus Crusade for Christ. They call it Crew now. They call, they call it the four spiritual laws. And they'd always say that just as there are natural laws that govern our natural world, so there are spiritual laws that govern our spiritual world. Law number one, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Law number two, all men have sinned and fallen short of God's plan for their life. And you would go through this little four laws, this, these four little laws that just explained how Jesus, through, uh, the, through God's offering for breaking the power of sin and death, would set you free from this cycle, this universal law. But I begin to talk about just physical laws. And well, let me just go just through, a, through a, a few of these natural laws just so you can connect this to your spiritual life. Did you know there's a, a law of heredity? Uh, you could go through this guy named Gregor Mendel, I think it was, in Austria, and he was in the 1800s, and he was looking at peas and how he could do different genetic traits as he would go through. And the one that I remember the most he talked about was the law of dominance, that you have two, you know, two traits, two, in, two things come together, and one's a dominant trait, and one's a recessive trait. And uh, I begin to think about my, my three kids. They have the same parents, but they came out different. I have one daughter who's, you know, thick like her dad. She's blonde hair. And then I have another daughter that came out. She's tall and thin, and she's, you know, got uh, brown hair. And then we had a son came out, and he was redheaded. Where'd that come from? It just, you know, well, there was, my wife obviously was, had red hair. And then I have a lot of people in my family that were red hair, even though my hair is not red now or not ever red, it was dark, it was brown, but obviously we carried a recessive trait through our genes with red, and when Davis was born, he came out red-headed. All three kids, same parent, but so that's heredity, and people kind of get that. Okay, I get that. So you have a lot of things you're born with that you just inherited. You can either bless your, bless your ancestors or curse them, but either way, you have hereditary, uh, hereditary traits that you've carried on. And I was looking at different other laws that they use, and I was amazed as I was doing this, just looking at this thing, the number of scientists that argue about laws, whether laws are really laws, and they're not generalizations. And they were just going through all these type of things, when is the law a law? So, you know, some of these people that are so advanced that uh, I'll just let them fight their arguments, you know, and they can go through all the, whether it's a law or not a law. But I can tell you a law that has worked uh, universally every time is the law of gravity. How many of you know that if I run straight this way and jump, I'm going right up to the ceiling? How many would say no? Why is that? Because the law of gravity would what? Pull me down. And this is true, universal truth, except when a greater law kicks in, which is the law of lift and thrust. And if you're in an airplane or a spaceship or even a balloon for that, you don't have to be bound by that universal truth that when you're in gravity and it pulls you 
or the people who are in space. How many know the law of gravity doesn't apply in space? It's like you're free, you're floating around, weightlessness. They go through all this training with astronauts. The point being is that the law of gravity is true in certain conditions and places, but it works on planet Earth. The law of sin and death is at work. The Bible is very clear about this. And I want to read you what the Apostle Paul wrote, because you read Romans 8, 1 and 2, it's like those are great verses, wonderful verses. But let's go back to Romans chapter 7. Let's read four verses in Romans chapter 7. So if you have your Bibles with me, in Romans chapter 7, verses 21 through 25. Now remember a law, according to the Bible, would be something like a... uh, a decree, uh, it means to distribute, to assign to everyone a command or a forbidding. A law is kind of like it applies to everybody. How many know that you have a speed limit and you're supposed to abide by that as you drive your car? Or wear a seat belt, that's part of the law, it's supposed to apply to everybody. So it is with these universal laws that God has. And so when I'm reading to you, these are things that apply to all of us. Uh, So we find this in Romans chapter 7, verse 21 for 25. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Christ Jesus our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. Now this scripture you read it, sometimes it gets all confusing like law, this, that, slave, captive, free. But he's talking about the struggle that every one of us go through. And that is that we have desires, passions, lust. Uh, We have things that want to take us away from how God originally created us. You have temptations. You have opportunities, either through speech or through action, uh, or the way that you do things, you just, you just simply are in your mind the way you think is that it creates in your mind and in your being destructive uh, characteristics that if you don't stop them, they will kill you. And that's the point when you come to church. This is not a church of perfect people in the sense of without sin, without fault, without blame. This is people that are coming in, and I don't know about you, but sometimes you just need to have a checkup. I was thinking about how many times do you go to the doctor? Well, if you're in a critical, life-threatening situation, you'd probably see the doctor on a very regular basis. If you're in a non-threatening life situation, you'd probably go visit the doctor on a regular basis. Why? Because you want him to check your physical body to make sure all the systems are working. How about when you go see the dentist? You want to check your mouth, check your teeth, make sure everything looks good. Those who have mouth issues with their teeth, gums, etc., they have to go see the dentist more often. Those of you who are flossing and brushing and doing all the right things probably see the dentist less. But the point is you're going for a checkup. So I thought, you know, when I come to church, this is a soul checkup. This is for God to come and check my soul. And I can tell you this is, uh, I think it was the writer C.S. Lewis wrote, he goes, you know, he says, when I look into my soul, he says, he says, I see a bedlam of lust running rampant throughout my soul. He said, I see where that I am controlled by passions and greed and desires that uh, he says are like an angry mob that just control my life. And he's trying to be a Christian, trying to serve Christ, but he has all these other attitudes. Maybe in your life this morning, maybe you're going through a place where you realize, you know, Pastor Mitch, I've given my heart to Christ, just like the Apostle Paul wrote here in Romans 7. He talked about the law of sin that's at work within him, the laws laws that are within the members of his body, with his mind. He's trying to serve God, but with his body, he's got these desires for sin. And you find these passions that grip you and control you. And if you don't don't understand the higher law, law, the law of sin and death will control your life and dominate you. 
But I'm here to give you some good news that Jesus wants to set you free from the law of sin and death. But I've got to talk about sin for a minute because it doesn't mean anything until you understand how he has set you free. And I think too often in the church, we ignore this and we try to cover it up, whereas you've got to get to the root of the problem. The root of the problem is, is that my nature, when I was born into this world, my nature was born with an attitude that I, Mitch, want to be God. And because I want to be God, I don't really want Jesus to control my life because I want to control my life. Right. And many of us in this room, in fact, I can make it a universal statement, all of us in this room have made choices that we wish God had made, uh, prevented us from making and not us making them. Amen. There are things we have done that we wish we'd not ever touched with a 10-foot pole. Amen. There are situations we've gotten involved with that we just think, dear Jesus, and then the devil's right there to lie to you that you are now unusable for the purposes of God because you did those things. And I'm talking about people who are believers. He's writing the book of Romans. He's not writing to their culture. We expect them to act the way they act. They don't know Jesus. But he's speaking to Christians, Christ followers. People who say, yeah, I'm sold out, committed to Christ, and yet they do all kinds of things. And my point this morning is that the Lord is speaking to the church. He's speaking to his family, to his, to his beloved bride. He's speaking to the ones he cares for. He's saying to us, I need you to do a soul check. I need you to look through your lives and see if there's anything that's causing sin, which will lead to death. And there's an incredible amount of laws the Bible talks about, the law of the spirit of life, the law of liberty, the law of love. I could go through all these laws that are there. We'll get to those. But you need to look at the law of sin and death. And I'm here to help parents who are struggling with their kids that are like middle school, high school. I'm here to talk about the parents who have to stand with their kids and get them to live for Jesus and walk with Jesus and talk about Jesus because, you know, in their culture and through our, our family units between husbands and wives that they'll love one another and serve one another and enjoy one another and, and not go the way that our culture is going. We're here to talk about that as, a, you know, as business people, we're running our businesses and this is that we're not controlled by greed, that we're not controlled by trying to uh, stick it to the other person, but as Christ followers that we're here to give people the best service at the best price because we love the Lord. We're talking about as we're walking with the things of God that we realize that Jesus, because you have set me free, I am indebted to spend the rest of my life every day serving you, loving you, worshiping you, because you have saved me. You've set me free. You've delivered me. Jesus, thank you that I can honor you with my life. Thank you, Jesus, in the midst of this pandemic that you've gathered here and that you haven't gone on to join the, our ancestors in the faith who've already moved on, that God still has you alive for this purpose. Hallelujah. I say to you, if you have breath in your lungs, you still have a purpose in Amen. God. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how uneducated you are. I don't care. I don't really care how, what you've done or haven't done. If you are alive, God has a purpose for your life. And I would rather buy into that than to go through the hopelessness that affects people. They eventually terminate their own lives. Yes. Yes. I remember being going to talk about Park Forest Middle School. I remember coming back to Park Forest Middle School days, 10 long years in that auditorium. Somehow things have just followed me all throughout my ministry life, set up and tear down. It seems like it never leaves. But anyway, you just 10 long years in that Park Forest Middle School. And I just, kept, I just kept having the idea, the notion, God, you want to do something. God, there's just something you want to do. Now listen to me. God, there's something you want to do, and you want to do it through me. Hallelujah. Big difference. Yes. Yeah, God wants to do something, but does he want to do it through you? And if he wants to do it through you, then you've got to make the commitment. And I remember sitting there thinking, God, I, I'm trying to let you do things through me, but this is, this is so, so discouraging in some ways. And then we're just uh, going through all these different adventures and trials, thinking about God. You know, we're a spirit-filled community. We believe in spiritual gifts. We speak in tongues. We pray for the Holy Spirit. And in a highly educated society that we're in, is that, that just seems to be anathema to a lot of people. 
Like they'd rather just be a church that's just kind of got, yeah, we'll talk about Jesus a little bit. We'll talk about things, but spiritual gifts, no, we're not going to put it on the, on the front burner of our church doctrine. And to me, that's the joy. It's the joy when God gives you words of knowledge. It's the joy when God gives you gifts of healing. It's the joy when God gives you the ability for deliverance. It's the joy when the Lord God gives you that spirit of might and power and you can break uh, the strongholds over people's lives. It's the joy when you're able to walk about as a free man and a free woman knowing there's nothing that Satan has that can hold you down because you've been set free by the law of spirit of life in Christ. What a joy. And it's all because of the Holy Spirit that God's come to sit, uh, to live in us. But there are people, I've had staff members that are ashamed of the Holy Spirit. I've had staff members that were just afraid to talk to people about being baptized in the Holy Spirit, even being water baptized. I'm like, you, you've got to speak kingdom truths. You've got to speak to people where, where they're at, what's going on. And we as a, as a church, we just have to be able to stand strong and say, this is the way God's made us. This is the way God's called us to worship. This is what God's called us to do. This is who we are. If you join us, great. If you don't join us, we're sorry. The Lord will put you where you need to be. But I'm here just to encourage you. Let the Spirit of God use you yes. for His purposes at this time. Say, God, just use me. God, just open my mouth. Let me just see, hear, feel. And you just begin to be available. So let's talk about the things that fight against us. Because the Apostle Paul described this, as I've taken too much time on this point. But he talks about this law, this law that's warring within his members. He's talking about the desires of his soul that are contrary to the purposes of God. And so if you read to the book, of, turn with me to the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter 5. Verses 16 through 21, in God's Word translation, it says it this way. Let me explain further. Live your life as your spiritual nature directs you, your spiritual nature. Talking about believers. Then you will never follow through on what your corrupt nature wants. What your corrupt nature wants is contrary to what your spiritual nature wants. And what your spiritual nature wants is contrary to what your corrupt nature wants. They are opposed to each other. As a result, you don't always do what you intend to do. If your spiritual nature is your guide, you are not subject to Moses' laws. Let me just stop here. You know, on Mount Sinai, when God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, which I would say they were like the don'ts, don't do this, this, and this. Like the first four deal with your relationship with God. The last six deal with your relationship with man. And he would say, don't do these things. It was very interesting that 3,000 people died at the giving of the law. Then you come over to I'll call it Mount Zion, which is where the Holy Spirit fell on the disciples in the day of Pentecost. God gave the Spirit, and 3,000 people were saved. So we're not living under the law. We're living under the Spirit. We're living under grace. But I think we need to understand that the law came God gave the law because it, point, it pinpoints to us our need for a Savior. In fact, I, wouldn't, I didn't read these scriptures, but in Romans chapter 7, the Apostle Paul wrote, he says, you know what? He says, the law is holy. The, ho the law is good. But when the law talks about coveting or lusting, he goes, I was doing fine until I read where the Bible says, do not lust or do not covet. And then he says, all these passions were aroused in my life because I read, don't do it. It made me want to go do it. And some of you, when you read the Bible, the Bible says, don't do certain things. And all of a sudden, you find the battle is on in your life. Like the Bible says, don't be angry. Or here, let's just read, let's just read this list. Because you read this and you realize, I think I'm guilty of all these things. Uh, it says, now the effects of the corrupt nature are obvious. So here's what happens to your corrupt nature. It says that it's illicit sex. Perversion, promiscuity, idolatry, drug use, hatred. Can you believe that he puts hatred in the same category as all those other things? Rivalry, jealousy, angry outburst, selfish ambition, conflict, factions, envy, drunkenness, wild partying, and similar things. I've told you in the past, and I'm telling you again, that people who do these kind of things will not inherit 
God's kingdom. So you have a list spelled out. I did not do this, but you could go through every book in the New Testament and it will tell you there are certain behaviors that are explicitly forbidden by the Lord. So when people come and tell you, I can live any way I want to because we're not under the law, we're under grace, I would advise you to run as far as you can from that theology. That is incorrect. And the Bible's very clear about these practices, and I'm speaking to parents, I feel this very strongly, that you have to teach your young people how to live and walk with Jesus and not be caught up in the culture that they find themselves growing in. That you have to be the mom and dad. In fact, I was thinking about, you know, why do we come to church? We come to, come, we come to church because Jesus saved my life. And because Jesus saved my life, it's my way of expressing back to him my gratitude. Therefore, we come to church. And my dad told my brother and I this. He would say, as long as you're under my roof, you're coming to church. And since I wasn't big enough to do anything about it, I went to church. And I could go on to say to you, as a parent, that some people say, oh, but you know, I made my kids come to church to turn them off. Let me just encourage you with this. The Spirit of God knows how to get the attention of your children. Amen. The Spirit of God knows how to draw them. Even when it looks like it's, it's, it's circumstances, you say, well, the youth group is this, or the kids ministry is this, or this thing's going on. I'm here just to encourage you. The Spirit of God will work with them, minister through them, share with them. He will get them in the right place at the right time. And all I can tell you is that you as a parent have to make a quality decision. And here's where we're at today. Here's, here's what to me is the most interesting thing as I watch, is that you have today, parents want their kids, to, and let's say I'll just pick on sports, but it could be any type of extracurricular activity, and it seems like the only time they can do their extracurricular activity is on the weekend. And they have, especially on Sunday, they have to go on Sunday to go participate in their tournament or their concert or their event or whatever it is. So every Sunday they have to do these things. And I'm watching the families battle through this. And all I can tell you is you have to make a quality decision what's important to you and your family. You have to decide what you're teaching your kids. This is the priority in your life. And right now the priority in your life is to make sure that you go do this event so every weekend we go do this event. I like, I had a daughter, she was qualified to play uh, collegiate sports, field hockey. And I just told her, I said, Caitlin, we are not going every weekend to go do some tournament. You're going to go to church. And I know that may cost us something, but down the road, this is what we're supposed to do. So you can do a tournament one weekend a month, the other three weekends, and the answer is you're going to church. Good. And we had to make a stand. People say, well, you're the pastor. Well, I come to church because I am the pastor. <laughs> most of the time. <laughs> I didn't say I wanted to come to church most of the time, but I said I did come to church. <laughs> but the point is, is that it was for my daughter. It was for her to understand that Jesus is important, and he's Good. important enough that's going to alter your schedule. Good. Yes. And you're going to find out that it's going to mean more to you than some temporary success in sports. And so today, she's in her mid-30s raising her kids, and guess what? Her kids are going to church. Hallelujah. She and her husband go to church. Small group leaders in their church they're at. So I just have to brag on them to say they are go they're going for God. Well, where did they learn it from? Well, because they grew up where they realized this is not an option. We are going to church. So let me just, this is not to condemn someone, but let me talk to some of you parents who got kids who moved out of the house. Are they active in church today? Because we've got article after article talking about the millennial generation, Generation Z and all these others that have completely abandoned the church. Well, why is that? Well, it's because we as parents, and put the blame on us, have failed to deliver them the utmost importance is you need to come to church. Yes. Jesus told us to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. That's in the midst of a pandemic. That's in the midst of sports tournaments. That's in the midst of any other excuse you could come up with. He said we are not to forsake the assembling ourselves together. You wonder why your children are more interested in carnal things and secular things and spiritual things? Because you, mom and dad, are letting them slide. You don't want to go through the hassle. You don't want to go through the conflict. You don't want to, and I understand it. I had to walk through it myself. I'm here to encourage you because of the days we're living in as a church, we have got to pay attention 
to what we're communicating to our kids, either verbally or non-verbally. And if Jesus is important to me, I will find ways to make sure that my family understands how important he is to me. Let me go through another situation, just since the Lord just directed me this way. When you're at home and you're not in church, what comes out of your mouth is just as critical as when you're sitting here talking to me in church. And it seems like that we have the amazing ability to be great actors and actresses. You come to church, everything's fine, I'm good, you're good, we're all good, no problems. Me and the little lady, we're just having a wonderful life. No, you're not. You got struggles going on, things going on, and I'm here just to encourage you. Is that that's why we feel like as a church, we say that we're not a church of perfect people. We're a church of imperfect people. Perfect people go to other churches. Imperfect people come here. There, I just categorized all you guys as imperfect people. Just took away your image right there. And the point is, the Apostle Paul said, going back to Romans 7, he says, I struggle with these things. I've got these passions and desires and things that are controlling me. So here's the good news. The good news is, yes, that's a universal law, the law of sin and death. The soul that sins, that soul shall die. But there's another law. And this is the freedom that comes. This is the joy that comes. This is the impact that it has. But you have to walk it out. You have to believe it. You have to decide that this is for you. Is the law and the life of the, the law and the spirit of life of Christ Jesus has set me free, and you walk it through. And the way you walk it through, the way you overcome, here's what's found. We'll close with these verses in Romans 8, verses 12 through 14. It says, So, brothers and sisters, we have no obligation to live the way our corrupt nature wants us to live. If you live by your corrupt nature, you are going to die. But if you use your spiritual nature to put to death the evil activities of the body, you will live. Certainly all who are guided by God's spirit are God's children. That's the point. Yeah, it's a universal law, the law of sin and death. It applies to all of us, every single one of us. But the Bible says by the spirit, you can put that corrupt nature to death. The Bible tells you this, one of the greatest verses in the Bible, Romans 6, 12, it says, for you're not under the law, but you're under grace, for sin shall not have dominion over your life. There is no sin in your life that God's not greater yet to set you completely and totally free. And we're seeing this happen over and over again every Sunday. I'm telling you, we're praying for people, ministering to people, people in drug addiction, people in alcoholism, people who are going through all types of just incredible, uh, just, just, just pressures in life and seeing Jesus set them free. And so we were talking about this, and I just, I just feel like the Lord just said, Mitch, you need to make an emphasis. The emphasis is not on what not to do. The emphasis is on what to do. And that is when you walk with Jesus, he gives you the ability to overcome every sin, every temptation that you face. You do not have to give in to sin. Now, here's the good news. If, in, ha- in fact, you do give in, you do stumble, you do mess up, you say something, you do something, you act a certain way that you know is not pleasing to the Lord, confess to him, and if you need to go speak to someone else and share with them to get free from it, that's what I would do. But I'm here to encourage you that just because you stumble doesn't mean that God's done with you. Just because you've got a struggle doesn't mean that you're inferior. Just because you're going through some battles in life, it doesn't mean that all of a sudden that God's left you. you got to stand strong. And so Pastor Rose had a word earlier today, and she was, uh, just came in, just shared it with me. She said, you know, she said, Pastor, she said, the last three nights God's woken me up with a dream. And she said, I really feel like there's someone just struggling with deep-rooted unforgiveness. And she said, it just, it's just come out of it. She talked about two, three different times that this thing just came up. It's like a, a hardness of heart. And I can just tell you that sin hardens the heart. And that's why it brings death. And that's why I'm making this appeal this morning. Here we are in 
February and it's cold outside and everybody's kind of going through COVID stuff and you're just trying to overcome and I'm here just to encourage you this morning. I'm here to and just to give you the, the good news is that you can overcome through the Spirit of God. You can overcome every sin, every temptation, every, every uh, device of the devil. You can overcome. You can walk free. You don't have to be under condemnation. You don't have to walk through guilt and shame that you can be an overcomer. And we're looking at a time and a place in our church and our culture where that we realize that the church has become so worldly and the world has become so churchy, you can't distinguish the two. And the Lord's looking for people that are willing to take that step and say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, I've made a decision to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Thank you, Jesus, I put my hand to the plow, and I am not looking back to where I came from. Jesus, I thank you this morning that I put my hand to the plow, and I've got some struggles, I'm going through some things, but I'm here to tell you that, to Jesus, that through you, I can overcome. Now, let me just go a little deeper this morning, and this is probably going to uh, affect maybe the, the response to the altar call, so to speak, but you know pornography is a huge issue. Do you know you can get it on your electronic devices? You can just walk around with your little smartphone, cell phone, and you can just download every type of pornographic image you want. Child pornography is running rampant. There's a huge mega church pastor. I won't go through all the details, but back when he was uh, just starting in the ministry, his dad, who was a minister, had been uh, violating and molesting little boys. And uh, you can, everybody knows about the quote, the Catholic Church and the priests, but I'm talking about in the Pentecostal circles. And this thing goes on, and this lust has grabbed people, controlled people, destroyed people, sexual lust, sexual impurity. I could go on and on with what's going on in church. I'm here to give you, just listen to this preacher. Listen to this plea. You do not have to serve that desire. You do not have to walk around with shame. You can walk free. Nice. And the way you're able to walk free is through a confession. You're able to say, man, I need Jesus. Yes. And you go to celebrate recovery where you're with a group of people who are broken as you are, who are, who are sojourners with you walking through this, and you're able to go through the steps to bring healing to your soul. Maybe you're at a place where you've just accepted your condition in life. You think, this is the way it's always going to be. My marriage is always going to be this way. My, you know, my unforgiveness towards my family, what they've done to me in the past, it's always going to be this way. And I'm here to tell you that that just cuts the legs of hope out from underneath you. He's a miracle working God. We just sang it. He's a way maker. He has a way where you have no way. You say, I have no way out. And God says, I've got a way. God says, I've got a solution. God says, I've got a strategy. God says, I've got a word for you. God says, I've got a hope for you. God says, I've got a plan for you. God says, I've got a, I've got a life-changing word directly for you. If you listen to me, I, God, will guide you through, and you will walk in victory. Amen. You will walk as an overcomer. You will walk as one who can say, yeah, I'm like the Apostle Paul. These passions are raging within me. All these things are contrary to the law of sin and death, the law of sin working in my members. But I know this, that through Jesus Christ, he has set me free Hallelujah. from the law of sin and death. He has set me free. And you're able to walk about just enjoying life. Why is that? Because Jesus has set you free. We won't talk about the law of your mind and things going on, but the Lord has such an incredible plan. But you got to pay attention to your spiritual life. So here's some things the Lord just spoke to me about. He's talking about just the amount of alcoholism that's going on. People just drinking. How about recreational drug use? People that are smoking their weed or people that are taking their pills. Fentanyl, in fact, we've been told on 700 Club, uh, they're describing the nation of China. It says America is weak. America is like they've put in enough, they've put in enough fentanyl drugs through China into the United States to kill every American seven times over. We're a nation of addicts. And you get in the church, it's the same. And I'm just like Jesus. You've created us for so much more than that. Jesus, you've created us for so much more sexual pleasure. Jesus, you've created my kids for something more than just to be run of the mill. 
God, you've created our family for something more than just going through life, caught up in all the snares and things that affect us. God, you've, done, you've got so much more in store for my life. I choose to believe that. I choose to believe that you want to use me for great purposes. God, I choose to believe that you've called me and selected me, know me by name. The God that you have a purpose for my life. God, I thank you today that I can walk free from sin, not because I'm a great overcomer, but because you are the overcomer. Yes. Lord, I thank you that today I can walk free. I can say no to those various lusts that seek to control my life. I've been set free from the law of sin and death. I refuse to surrender my liberty in Christ for some temporal pleasure. Lord, I thank you this morning that as I walk with you that I'm no longer bound by uh, the law, but I have the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of grace. Therefore, the grace of God comes into my life, sets me free from the law of sin and death. It's because why is that? Because the effort is not on me, it's on Jesus. I can't overcome, but Jesus can. And because of his spirit living within me, he gives me the power, he gives me the ability, he gives me the wisdom, he gives me the strategy on how I can overcome sin. And I go back to this one quick story, I'm trying to close, but I keep thinking of all kinds of things, trying to discern, is this the Lord, is this me? But you know, my dad was raised by a single mom. My dad was born, I think, in, in fact, no, he was born in 1934. And he was raised by a single mom. He was raised in a very rough uh, area of Huntsville, Alabama. He talked about it. He got beat up all the time and just this stuff. And as a little six-year-old boy, he'd go into this little Methodist church. He asked the preacher if he could preach. And my dad would get in there and preach. And, but as my dad got up into middle school and high school, smoking, drinking, running around, chasing women, doing all this stuff, went into the army. He was, he, he got, my dad got so messed up in New York City one time, he failed to report in. He should have been court-martialed, and his sergeant had mercy on him because he was so messed up and just let him go. But my dad was doing drugs back, this is back in the early 50s. My dad was a mess. He was a loser from every sense of the word loser. And a Baptist preacher came to his house because his mom wanted to go to church, and I had been born, and they'd gone to St. Louis, Missouri, had gone to this little church, and following Saturday, they didn't know pastors made uh, house calls. And he's in his little apartment drinking beer with his friend Mickey, who was an army buddy, and they were just discussing all this stuff. And they get a knock on the door, and it's that Baptist preacher. And Dad and Mickey are sitting back in the kitchen, and Mickey's like, he didn't come to see me, so don't get him back here. And Mom and Dad are staring at each other like, he's not coming to see us. They're both in their early 20s here. So they open the door, he comes in, talks, and my dad lets the preacher know, I don't want anything to do with your religion, your Jesus, just hit, get out of here. So the guy thanked him for, after a few minutes of visit, shared with him, got up to leave, and my dad said as he opened the door to walk out of their apartment, before that door closed, my dad said his life flashed in front of his eyes. And he knew in that moment, in that moment, his life had been spared. He should have died multiple times. The guy closed the door, walked him down the sidewalk. Dad turned to my mom and said, that's what I'm going to do. My mom was terrified. She thought he was going to beat up the preacher. <laughs> she said, what are you going to do? He says, as much as I've served the devil, I'm going to serve Jesus. Oh, yeah. My dad made that decision right there. I'm going to serve Jesus. Went back in, told his friend Mickey, said, Mickey, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to serve Jesus. Mickey said, oh, Joe, that won't last long. I'm going to drink some more beer and chase women. That's what I'm supposed to do. And my dad told me later on, his friend Mickey had been through multiple marriages, multiple relationships because Mickey didn't want to serve Jesus. But my dad made a choice to serve Jesus. So I can say I am standing here today because of some Baptist preacher in St. Louis, Missouri that dared to make a house call to go talk to a young couple that had really nothing to offer them except he had a passion to introduce him to Jesus. Your life counts. Amen. Your witness counts. One little word from Jesus, one little hope from God, one little act of kindness can change a person's life. Amen. And God will do that for you. But first he said, get us free. Get us free from stuff so we're not under condemnation. So we can walk as sons and daughters of God. We can just enjoy our relationship with him.
you guys would be so kind to stand with me. Just bow our heads for a moment. This is between you and God. If you're on the ministry team and you would like to pray, you can come forward and stand up here. We'll just be praying for all kinds of needs. But I'm here to make a simple plea with you this morning. There is no condemnation, no judgment, no separation for those who have decided the spirit of life in Christ has set me free from the law of sin and death. Struggles are great, battles are hard, but at the end of the day, you can overcome. Speaking to people in the church right now, you know where your struggles are, you know what's going on, I would encourage you, if you've got something that just seems to be overwhelming your soul, I would receive prayer this morning, I'd make confession, whatever I need to do, get free so that I can walk in the victory that Jesus has promised for me. For those that are struggling with unforgiveness and hatred and all that kind of stuff, hardness of heart, I would encourage you, this is your moment for Jesus to set you free. For those who are watching online, I would just encourage you to take a moment and just take a moment of reflection and just introspection and just say, Jesus, Holy Spirit, just come and just search my heart. See if there be any unclean way in me. Lord, purify my thoughts. And then I would just continue on. I would just speak uh, to the church just to say, there is such a freedom and liberty that we've yet to enjoy as the body of Christ that God's bringing us into. And I'm telling you this, I'm just saying by the Spirit that the days of freedom, the days of liberty, the days of being able to understand that you're, you're, you're in the midst of a battle, like Job went through the midst of a battle, but at the end of his life, it says he doubled all of his possessions. He doubled, all, he got all of his kids uh, uh, back. He, got, he just saw God restore his health. God restored him back because he trusted God through the midst of his battle. I hear that very strongly this morning. Let me just speak prophetically to that. I just hear there's a family situation going on and the battle's raging hard. And I hear that uh, you're in the midst of this crisis. And just like Job, he says, God, where are you? God, I've served you. I've loved you. And this is the result of my life. And I would just give you a word of encouragement this morning. Job held on to his faith. Job held on to his integrity. Job just said that I will not curse God. I will not turn my back on God. He will give me through this and sure enough he did and the Lord would say that to you that he will pull you through you're in the midst of a battle the midst of a storm but the Lord's going to pull you through I hear the Lord speaking to me also that just resolve I hear the Lord saying that many of you know the right thing to do I'm speaking to parents and kids you know the right thing to do and I'm here to encourage you I'm here to strengthen you here to just, just to encourage you as you walk with God and you serve God in your home serve God behind closed doors serve God when you're not just sitting here in church but you're just going for the things of God your kids will get it they'll have that desire they'll have that appetite to want to serve God and go for God because they'll see the changes he's doing in your life I see the Lord doing some things in some married couples, and I'm here just to encourage you this morning. Let the Lord bring a tender heart. Let the Lord bring the softness of heart. Let there not be hardness of heart. I see like with Pastor Rose in that word, and this is just one little facet of that word of unforgiveness that she had, but I feel like it goes back like almost generations that there's been the, a hardness of heart. Maybe as a young person, some things happen. It's just created this hardness of heart, and the Lord wants to set you free this morning. You can let go of years and years and years of, of frustration and anxiety and despair because the Lord will set you free. He's a God who's above time. We also believe this morning that the Lord wants to introduce people to himself. And maybe you're here this morning like my dad, when he was a little boy, he used to go to church and then he grew older and walked away. Maybe you're in that condition this morning. I'd like to encourage you. I'm going to pray with you. Then have you come up and minister to someone. Just let someone pray with you. But just say this words with me. Just talk to Jesus. He's here. Saying, Lord Jesus, I ask you to forgive me. Cleanse me. Fill me. Jesus, I ask you to be my Lord and Savior. And you say those words, and I'm telling you, the Lord hears it, and the Lord answers. He responds. Maybe you're here this morning. You say, you know, Pastor Mitch, I've got an alcohol problem. I've got a drug problem. I've got... We're used to that. We get it. We understand. Maybe you're going through that heaviness that I talked about earlier, that young lady that committed suicide, just got so hopeless and despair. And even though she was a beauty queen and had all the, uh, the, the society just giving her all the high accolades, and she still committed, still committed suicide. 
and you're going through stuff in your life, just hopelessness, and I'm here just to encourage you, the Lord wants to set you free. Maybe you got a battle with pornography and the Lord just wants to set you free, and I'm here just to tell you that Jesus is a deliverer. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus.